every January and every July, I get a phone call from down in Dallas. It's from a place called the Tom Landry Center. Not as cool as it sounds. The woman on the other line, it's always a woman, um, says, hey, uh, we're gonna need you to be here about an hour before your appointment so you can sit around in our waiting room for that hour and read magazines that you don't care about. (laughs) And so if you could show up an hour early to wait an hour and a half, that would be awesome. (laughs) That, That would be them being honest. Um, and, and don't forget, you need to bring your last three scans. And at that call, my fight with anxiety flares up. So then I go over to where we keep the scans and I pull out the last three and I set them up on the kitchen counter and then I wait for seven days. Seven days later, I'll grab those scans. Lauren will get in the car with me and we will drive straight down 35 down to Baylor downtown to the Tom Landry Center where I'll walk in and I'll wait for about an hour and a half out in a waiting and I will read magazines that I don't care about. I'll sometimes read articles that are on my phone. I'll sometimes bring um, something to work on, but I'm, I'm there about an hour, about hour and a half later um, after I've filled out a form where I label my birth date and weight on every one of the 15 forms because of HIPAA laws. If you want to make a billion dollars, figure out how to not break HIPAA laws and not have to write your weight like it changed. Like after the first one, like all of a sudden I lost a pound writing that. Whose metabolism works like that? And so I get all of that filled out. And then uh, a sweet nurse will come out and grab me. They will lead me to the back where I wait again. Um, And then finally, another nurse will come and grab me. And they will uh, take a needle, a one-gauge needle, which is, if it sounds like a spear, that's what it is. uh, And and they will stick that into this poor vein right here, or sometimes this one right here. And then guess what I get to do? I get to wait again. And then after a while, uh, another tech will come grab me and then they will take me um, into um, a cold room with weird noises with a giant steel door. And they will lie me down on a little bed and they will anchor my head to uh, the table and they will slide me into an MRI machine and for the next 40 minutes, I get to listen to someone else's favorite songs. (laughs) And, And I'm just waiting And then after I get out of the MRI, this is twice a year, this is every January, this is every July, um, I get to, guess what, wait again. And so for about three hours, Lauren and I just piddle. Uh, We're down in Dallas, so we like the idea of the city, so visiting the city is fun for us, so we'll go uh, play around some, and then we'll head to my neuro-oncologist. And then guess what we get to do again? We get to wait again. And then Karen will come in and she throws up my scan. She doesn't piddle a lot. She will just immediately tell me results, which praise God for that, all right? I'm not there to be buddies. I like Karen, but I'm not like, hey, how's life? I'm like, how's my brain? (laughs) And she comes in and to this point, five years in, she goes, looks perfect, looks great. It's all stable. This is what we want. And then we'll start a little, make sure I've got no degenerative effects from surgery and chemo. And now the reality, I hate the scan. I hate it. Look at me. And I love the scan. Now, here's why. Maybe one day she'll throw that thing up and go, ah, look at that. Dang it, we didn't want to see that. So we're going to have to start you on Timidar again. And then we're going to have to start realigning life. I'm right? probably going to have to resign from this, going to have to stop doing this. We'll have to pull in, figure out how to do life on chemo again. I don't know the results of the scan. Every time I go in and lay on that table, I have no idea. But here's why I love the scan. I'm going to hear, all clear, you're good for six months. Or I'm going to hear, here's how we treat this. To not have the scan. To take that call and go, thank you, Tom Landry Center, but I'm not coming. Mm. I, I mean, I couldn't do that. We don't, who has a, that kind of phone anymore, right? Be like, mm. <laughs> Just forgot where I was for a second. Like the 20-somethings were like, what did he, I don't understand what that was. Why would he, does, does he have a case, like an otter box on his iPhone? Is he trying to crush that? No, I, if I did that, here's what I do. I put myself in a situation where I don't know whether or not I'm healthy or sick, and so I can't celebrate health, and I can't get help if I'm sick. In the same way, when James bears its weight on us and says, hey, listen to me. If you have no desire to be obedient to the word of God, you're not a Christian. We've got this opportunity to go, gosh, I desire. Praise God, I'm saved. 
Now, I have that desire. I've made progress. I'm not what I once was. Praise his name. I'm an adopted son. I'm an adopted daughter. I'm loved by God. Praise his name. Or we go, oh, God. And then let mercy triumph over justice. Judgment. Let mercy triumph over judgment. See, if you're in here and you're just a total fake and veneer, there's good news for you. As good a news there is for you as there is for um, the, the prostitute and drug addict that God forgives. In fact, I am most often more astonished by those who profess Christ out of Sunday school classes and small groups than I am with the drug addict and prostitute because no prostitute or drug addict goes, this is what I dreamed of when I was a kid. They know their life is broken. They know they need help. But the self-righteous, the self-righteous are kind of inoculated to Jesus. They feel like they already have him despite all the objective evidence that they don't. In fact, you know the first chairman of elders here at the Village Church came to know Christ when he was the deacon of a small Baptist church? How you like that, walking down the aisle as chairman of the deacon board? You think he sat in his seat and wrestled for a bit? Gosh, what are they gonna say? I mean, I'm the chairman of the deacons. It's gonna get weird. Walking up, hey, I know I'm kind of your boss, but I'm lost, can you pray with me? You know, I, that's, that's a weird moment. And so what would be a terrible, terrible thing is for you to right now have the word of God Read your scan and go, ah, we're sick. We're sick. And go, man, I can't say I'm sick. Everybody looks at me like I'm the picture of health. Well, you die if you do that. Do you really think your projected godliness is more valuable than actual godliness? You know, hear how crazy that is? I want to look godly, don't want to be godly. People think I'm godly, so if I confessed I wasn't godly, what would happen to them? Well, they might be encouraged that you're finally honest and it probably makes sense at, at why there's not a lot of fruit in your life. Let mercy triumph over judgment. This is the great invitation laid into this warning. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. For those who are really wrestling now. Am, am I a Christian? Am I not? Father, I pray that you would grant them the courage and strength to let us wrestle with them. Let us struggle with them. That they would be quick to come and grab the hand of a man or a woman or head to Connection Central, grab the hand of a man or a woman and just say, hey, pray for me, help me. I'm confused. I'm not... I'm confused by what pastor said. How am I to think this is where I'm struggling? Help me get clarity here. Father, I pray that you would grant salvation where one thought they previously were. And I pray that you would grant encouragement for the weary struggler who struggles on that they might have the lens to see that that is an objective evidence that your Holy Spirit is inside of them, progress, not perfection. Thank you for your grace and mercy that covers all of our shortcomings and sins. We turn now to celebrate that and the breaking of the bread and the rejoicing in the cup as a community of faith, seeking to show no partiality, but to love and to serve as you love and as you serve indiscriminately and with compassion and mercy to all around us. It's for your beautiful name that we pray, amen. Let me just end with this. Let us walk with you. If you're struggling with doubt, if you're wrestling with what all this means, that's okay. Just let us walk with you. Don't leave here feeling that burden without inviting us into that burden with you. Uh, and so we'll sing and then be dismissed. And there are going to be some men and women here. And there are going to be some men and women in Connection Central. And so I'm pleading with you as one who knows the scab I just picked at. That you would allow us to walk alongside of you until your confidence in the saving work of Christ 
swells so that sermons like this lead all the more to rejoicing and not to questioning. See, as we progress, as we mature, as we grow in an understanding of the faith, these type of sermons actually serve as fuel to rejoice, not as tripwires that make us wrestle. So let us help you get there. And so to do that, you'll have to be honest that that's where you are. And so I would plead with you to not let the kind of fake, faux, veneer, ridiculousness of Bible Belt Christianity um, serve as an anchor on your soul. But man, let us walk with you. You're not going to shock us. We're not dumb that this happens. We've experienced it ourselves. Let us serve you that way. So let me pray for you. We'll sing a song and then we'll be dismissed. There'll be men and women up here, men and women in Connection Central. Don't wrestle alone. Father, thank you. You are good and gracious. We love you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Love you guys so much. Let's sing.